everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the Annex Labs at Bar Ilan University, and now we'll be going over the Kahoot for Lecture 4, Design Metrics. In this Kahoot, we'll have five questions. What is the job of the first inverter in the fan out for delay measure? Is it measuring its TPD, dampening the Miller effect, shaping the rise fall time, or simulating the fan out for low? Well, I'm going to go for shaping the rise fall time. Let's see why this is correct. Measure fan out for delay. What is fan out for delay? So actually, in previous courses, we saw that usually when you want to drive a big load, what you should do is take each of your gates and make it uh, drive a gate that's up to or uh, about four times the size of the gate. We uh, did some sort of uh, back of the envelope calculation. We got to 3.6, but um, in general, something like uh, the number four is a kind of a good number of how a self-load, you know, how a, a gate should be loaded. So um, what we want to do is we want to often use the fan out four metric to say what a um, gate's delay is um, without regarding the, the technology, kind of normalized to the technology. So that's uh, using the fan out four delay, saying if we take a gate and we load it with something that's four times its size, then what is uh, the delay? That's a delay in fan out four measurements. Um, and this is something that was introduced to, by David Harris back in his uh, PhD times at Stanford. And he, of course, is one of the guys who wrote one of the main books on VLSI design. Okay, so um, what uh, I, I want to use the, the measurement kind of simulation to just show you some good practice for simulation. So what we do is, um, what we, we do is we have, you know, four gates. We're going to use inverters, of course. And these gates are going to be little by little. Um, made bigger. Well, I guess not so little. It's actually exponentially bigger, right? So if this gate is, you know, uh, times one, this one's going to be times four to make this fan out for kind of delay. Then this one's going to be times 16, and this one's going to be times 64. Okay, and what we're going to do here is we're going to um, bring our, you know, our step inside here, right? Um, and then we're going to measure the delay throughout here. So the question was, what is the job of this inverter? And actually, this is something that you want to take in and uh, use as practice for all of your simulations in, in any case. Uh, when we take a voltage source like this, it's a perfect voltage source. It's ideal. Uh, when we go and we say we want to, you know, have some sort of a rise time that we write as you know, kind of a TR type of parameter inside our simulation, uh, it doesn't matter what we're driving. We could drive a small inverter or a huge inverter. That rise time is going to be the rise time. This has basically um, uh, a infinite type of strength. And that's not true for, you know, a, a real design. So what we always want to do is we want to take uh, some sort of a buffer. And again, this is going to be some sort of, a, you know, a CMOS inverter. It could be, again, a buffer, which would be two inverters. Right. And when um, we drive this up, we're going to have to take this, uh, you know, the capacitance that's over here and we're going to have to discharge it. So it's going to be discharging through this transistor. And this transistor is a finite type of a current source. It can't do this at an infinite type of a pace, which will mean that the fall on this uh, on this node is going to be, um, you know, non infinite. It's going to be technology dependent and it's going to be really if we had this uh, times one. Um, driving something that's four times its size, this is going to be very, um, uh, you know, characteristic of a fan out four type of a uh, driving mode. So um, this is going to be realistic. This is non-realistic. This is non-realistic. Uh, um, whereas this is uh, realistic for the technology. So it will, uh, for the technology, it's actually like characteristic of the technology. And so what we always want to do in all simulations is any input we want to drive through a buffer. And therefore, the buffer will shape the um, rise and fall time of its output. And so if we go back to the Kahoot again, um, what we saw over here is that the first inverter in the fan out for delay, is, it's, its uh, job is to shape the rise and fall time. With that, we can go to the second question, which is, of course, what is the job of another one of the inverters, the third inverter in the fan out for delay measurement? Is it to measure the TPD, to dampen the Miller capacitance, to shape the rise fall time, or to simulate the fan out for load? And I don't think it's to shape the rise fall time because that was the answer to the previous one. I'm going to say that it's to simulate the fan out for load. 
so let's go back to our picture over here and discuss the the other um, the other inverted. So really, this one is again for shaping, as we said, um, right? This one is the DUT. This is what we measure uh, measure the actual uh, you know the actual TPD on. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure you know the time that this reaches fifty percent until um, this guy reaches fifty percent. Uh, and again, 50% is not necessarily the, the true metric. There are different ways of doing it, but in, in a lot of times we take a 50% to 50% change between the input and the output, and the, 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 this difference is going to be our TPD. So really the second inverter over here is for measuring the TPD. The third inverter, of course, is the fan out for load. This is just the load, okay? So this, we see, when we look into here, we're going to see four times the capacitance of, of this guy, okay? So this really is the load, all right? So that's what its job is. It's to show us a load that is a four times uh, uh, equivalent of this guy. And um, so really the third inverter is for the fan up for load. So finally, what is this one for? And actually we don't need an X64 over here. We can just put a large enough capacitor that we don't have something uh, truly small. So basically inside a CMOS inverter, okay, um, what we have is we have uh, lots of capacitances that, uh, you know, are connecting our different, uh, uh, our different uh, nodes over here. And we have, you know, uh, capacitors on the outside and so forth. But we also have these feed through capacitors. So capacitors from the gate to um, the drain of both the NMOS and the PMOS. And this is a direct, you know, um, connection between the input and the output. And remember, a, a CMOS gate is supposed to be a buffer. It's completely supposed to separate our input from our output. They're not supposed to be have any connection to each other. We're supposed to make some sort of change over here. It's supposed to cause some sort of change over here. And we know what the TPD and the T-rise and T-fall over are here. But um, what this uh, this connection does, this capacitance does, it, it, co it connects the two of them, it causes some sort of a noise, okay? And um, basically what happens is, is that the high harmonies over here, um, you know, the high uh, frequencies will go directly through the other side and they'll cause, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, jumps over here and so forth. And, um, and we also have this Miller capacitance type of a thing. So what we want to do is we want to dampen basically the effect it's going to cause but because of these feed through because of this Miller capacitance type of thing uh, number one number two is we also have the output is going to be um, uh, 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 changing so we had this rise over here it's going to cause a fall over here okay so this guy is going to be going down while this guy is going to be going up um, and that actually with Miller capacitance is going to kind of double what uh, this guy uh, kind of sees over here. It's going to almost see that it has to do double the, uh, the, the drive. And that's not really true. It only happens when, um, when the fall time at the output is going to happen much faster than the TPD. So we want to make this fall time take more time and not uh, happen immediately. And therefore, we have to put some sort of a bigger capacitance that's going to cause the uh, TPD to be um, in, in the same order of magnitude as the TPD of the, uh, of the, the guy before it, the, the measured load, um, which will cause this capacitance to not look like it's, uh, it's equal to the capacitance over here and will be dampened to a, a real type of a point of what our Miller capacitance is going to be, going to be which is going to be much uh, smaller. So this is just to dampen the Miller capacitance effect. That's to dampen the Miller capacitance. Again, what we have over here is we have uh, measuring the TPD is uh, going to be the second. Also, the first inverter is shaping the rise fall time. The second one is measuring the TPD. Um, the third one is simulating the fan out for load, which was a question over here. And the fourth one is dampening the Miller capacitance. Question number three, which of the following is not a component of the NRE, the non-recurrent engineering costs? Is it the salary of the engineers, the cost of the package, the price of the mask set, or the electricity for the air conditioning of the office? Well, this sounds stupid. It's probably the electricity for the air conditioning of the office. But actually, it's the cost of the package. So let's go back over here, and what we have in the cost of the integrated circuit is that there are two main factors. The first one is the, the, the NRE, which we can also call the fixed cost of the chip. 
And then we have the recurrent cost that is the cost per chip. Cost per manufactured chip or something like that. Not necessarily manufactured, as we'll see on the after the next Kahoot question. But really, the, the cost of the chip is going to be equal to, you know, this fixed cost, which we paid just to make our first chip. So we take that fixed cost. But really, uh, if it cost us a million dollars to make a chip and we made a million chips, then actually the fixed cost per chip was only one dollar. So we divide that by the volume or by the number of chips, you know, that we sell. Okay. But then we have to add to that the actual cost we pay for each chip. So that's the recurrent cost. And, and this is true for basically any product in, in the world. The, the cost is going to be the cost of development divided by the number of ones we sold, plus the recurrent cost for, for, for making and selling one more of those. Um, and this fixed cost is what we call NRE. And NRE is really important. It's, it's really high for chips, and only because the volume tends to be very, very high for ASICs. Uh, in fact, we won't go into an ASIC product uh, project unless we know that the number of chips is going to be high. So we can take this fixed cost and take it down as low as possible. Um, the recurrent cost isn't going to be, usually depends on a lot of things, but it's not going to be that high. What's going to be really high is the fixed cost. For instance, the cost of a tape out, as we can see, or the cost of a max set, uh, you know, in 28 nanometers, it was already at $1.5 million dollars according to this uh, graph from any silicon friends of any silicon but you know it's it's up way higher than that i mean in five nanometer i know that companies are talking you know of five million dollars okay so um something like that and that's a very round number it really depends on you know your deals with the foundry and all kinds of other things and this the the, the cost actually goes down as the process matures and so forth and um, nowadays with the uh with the chip uh crisis, you know, we, we have a lack of chips in the world, I think that the price of a tape out actually goes up. But that's all NRE. That's just a cost that we pay, um, you know, for making the first chip. Even if we get a bad product that's dead on arrival and we don't sell any chips, we still pay that up front. And therefore, that's part of our fixed costs. So those are non-recurrent engineering costs. The same goes for things like the, the salaries of the engineers. It's non-recurrent engineering costs. So obviously, we're paying these salaries for you know the two-year development cycle. And we paid that even if we don't sell any chips. Um, the same goes for the air conditioning in, in, in our building and many, many, many other things, the cost of the tools and, and all kinds of things. Those are our one co uh, one-time cost factor. Um, really, and uh, again, tape out or mass generation is a big part of that, but the engineering is usually the, the highest part of that, and just all kinds of other things. You know, the, the, the cookies you buy for your, your uh, employees or when you take them out on a, on, a, you know, on a field trip or something like that. On the other hand, recurrent costs are things like silicon pro uh, processing and packaging and so forth. So if we go back to our Kahoot question, you know, the salaries of the engineers, those, as we said, are really part of the NRE, as is the price of the mask set or the price of the tape out. Um, similarly, the electricity for the air conditioning of the office, it wasn't something I just wrote to, to, to make a joke over here. Really, all kinds of um, strange uh, peripheral costs that we have to take care of anyway, they are part of the NRE. Okay. However, the cost of the package, at least in the way I, I provided here in the model, is not part of the NRE. We only package chips that we make. So if we, you know, again, have that uh, really bad case where we got a chip that was dead on arrival, or, um, you know, one day we stop selling the chips or we sell very few of the chips, we, didn't, we don't pay for their package. We only pay for the packages that we actually take the, the good chips and put them in. Um, the reason I just said that that's not exactly true is because, first of all, everything usually has a, a piece of the NRE as well. Development of the package, which is part of the NRE, actually does cost quite a bit. So I didn't show it in the model over here, but there are pr parts of cost of the package that are part of the NRE. Okay, question number four. What is the difference between die yield and final test yield in the model that we learned? Die yield is set according to wafer testing. Final test yield is set after packaging the good dyes. Both answers A and B are correct, or both answers A and B are incorrect. And as we saw here, we have final test yield and we have die yield. And I'm going to choose answers A and B. 
and let's go and see why. Again, this kind of tends to cause a lot of students a, a headache, and this is just a really simplified model, everything I show here. It's not um, something that's perfectly true, but I just wanna uh, g give an idea of what kind of things happen when we, we make ch chips. So again, the, the um, the, the kind of uh, model that I showed before is that the cost of each die that we make is the variable cost and the fixed cost divided by the volume. This again is the NRE and these are the recurrent costs. Okay, and that's probably true for any um, product that is going to be sold in, in, in any field, not just chips. Okay, but when we go and try to look at the chips, what we're going to do is, uh, again, the NRE, that's, uh, we said it's the, the, the salaries and the mask set and just a million other things that go into that. And I'm not going to be going and discussing uh, some sort of uh, lower model for that. But if we take the variable cost for IC, we can kind of break it down. And one of the ways that we can break it down, and again, this can go into much uh, deeper detail, and each company probably has these big you know, spreadsheets that show how, um, uh, what their cost is going to be to see uh, what price they should sell the chip and so forth. But there's going to be what we call the die cost, and that we're going to go deeper into. But we also take those dies, every die that was successfully made, we have to put it in a package in order to uh, be able to test it and see what it is. And we also have to pay the, for the testing. And the testing can be, again, cost of you know uh, us having our engineers work the tester and so forth, or just uh, or it could be that we send it out to some testing house that does this for it. And um, so test, uh, testing is something that we uh, have to apply uh, per each package to die, and that's gonna uh, have some sort of cost. So once we take a die that we know that it, 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 we wanna you know, uh, package it and so forth, we put the package on, we have to pay for the package, we test it, and unfortunately some of those after test are gonna fail, so we throw out some of them, and that's why we divide it by final test yield. So basically whatever came out of this is a product that we're already gonna sell, and that's final test yield. The final test yield is after we've packaged and, and, and tested the dies. However, this can be substantially expensive. And in order to save that, what we're going to really try to do is we're going to try and test as many dies as we can when they're still on the wafer. So here we see the wafer and we're going to have a, we're going to develop a probe card, you know, that's going to have all these different pins on it. And these pins can go down directly on a specific die and put in as many test patterns as possible to see if this specific die is good or not and even what kind of frequency it can run at so we can do some binning and sorting and so forth. Uh, and, and so really, if we can do as many um, tests at the wafer level before we've actually gone off and packaged the die, then we can um, throw out as many dies as possible. So probably in this type of a picture, these ones that have these little markings on them, they're what we call inked. And that means they're probably bad dies and we can just throw them out before we actually spend uh, money on the package. So that would be called the die yield. So die yield is the percentage of dies on the wafer that are good uh, doing wafer level testing. And the more wafer level testing, the more of the package costs and test costs we save. And so it's really important and we wanna do as much as possible at wafer level testing. So that's where the die yield comes in. Um, the cost of the die, we can uh, break it down to the cost of the wafer. So we're gonna pay a certain amount to the fab for, um, for you know, uh, manufacturing each wafer. And then they're gonna dice it, they're gonna cut it up into pieces, and each die is basically the, the cost of how much it costs to process a single wafer divided by the number of dies that we have on the wafer. And of course, some of those dies we're gonna throw out, and that's why the die yield is over here. Okay, so that's basically the, um, the, the model that we showed in the class. And again, so die yield, is, which is the one that is over here, is set according to the wafer testing. So we did wafer testing, we threw out some of the dyes that we already were able to see without packaging that they were uh, bad, and that is our dye yield. Final test yield over here means that we packaged uh, the dye, we did a final test, and then we threw out some. So the final test yield is after packaging the good dyes, and that's why both A and B are correct. And our final question for this Kahoot, why didn't wafer size follow Moore's law? And really, why didn't in the year 2000 we already have a 57 inch wafer? Well, is it because it's hard to make machines that can process big wafers? Is it because big wafers are uneconomical for fabulous companies? Is it because the larger the dies, the more it affects? Or is it because the final tests become much more difficult? And the reason is, is it's because it's really hard to make machines that can process big wafers. 
I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons for this, but really, um, again, if we started with uh, small wafers that were maybe 100 millimeter back, uh, you know, uh, a long time ago, 40 something years ago, um, the, the wafer sizes increased and really eight inch wafers were, were very popular and it came to 12 inch wafers in around the year 2000. Well, this, which is a 15 inch wafer, it never happened. We still, still, still don't have 15 inch wafers. And the question is, who is behind that? Um, if I'm in a company like Apple, a fabulous company, well, do I prefer to have a 300 millimeter wafer or a 450 millimeter wafer? And of course, I, I, I would love to have a 450 millimeter wafer because then I'd get more chips per wafer and then I could have a uh, lower, you know, cost per die because uh, the wafer processing would be uh, uh, primarily the same maybe it cost a bit more but again you know it take it would take pretty much probably the same amount of time because it's a VLSI process to process this bigger wafer than this one and I get more dyes out of it and therefore the cost per die would go down um, I would able if I'm the fab I can get more dyes out uh, because I have a big wafer so everybody really wants this uh, except for probably the manufacturers of the the equipment you know remember this is a big area right the dies are really small and I need to make sure that a transistor over here and a transistor over here and a transistor over here transistor over here are exactly the same and there are billions and trillions and you know uh, gazillions of these transistors on one of these wafers and I need to make sure that the process variation between them is is minuscule on all these um, very mini 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 process steps at amazingly small uh, geometries and so forth and that's really hard to do um, for uh, you know something that's uh, really small but it's in incre incredibly hard to do when I make the area that this has to cover bigger and bigger uh, I really would have to go and change all my machines to be able to process these wafers and so forth and therefore really um, we never have been able to bring um, all the many many machines that we have in a fab to be able to handle you know larger wafers at a high enough uh, yield and a high enough level so we do not have even the 450 uh, millimeter you know the 15 inch wafers we're really stuck at the 12 inch wafers even though most of the e ecosystem would be really glad to upgrade to a larger wafer or get to you know this 57 inch wafer that we see in in the picture over here so really the reason is uh, due to the equipment even though the other reasons probably are are, are also so true. It's probably economical and uh, I don't think it has anything to do with the final test yield. Um, the larger the die, the more defects and that may have something to do also with the wafer size, but it, it's a secondary type of thing. Usually it's just because there's some sort of defect density in, in the uh, fab fabricating. Okay, so that was it for this Kahoot. And again, as always, you feel free to ask me questions on my channel.